Hi, this is Scott Fish. Thank you for joining me on my YouTube channel to listen to a conversation I had with Cindy McGurl. Drummer, band leader, composer Paul Motion was one of my first feature interviews for Modern Drummer. Uh, the interview we did appeared in the April, May 1980 Modern Drummer. And I remember picking Paul because I loved his songwriting. I liked his playing jazz drums without a heavy reliance on the traditional ding, 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 ding cymbal beat. He was the first drummer I heard to break away from from that and he did um, some amazing playing throughout his his extensive career using that concept last year i had friends visiting rockland maine which is not too far from where i live and they were uh vacationing out there and told me that they met a woman living there she had a local radio station and it was dedicated to Paul Motion. Plus, they said she had all Paul Motion's belongings in a Rockland warehouse, his drums, his records, his yeah, everything, soup to nuts, all his belongings. So that piqued my curiosity. Who was this woman and how did she end up curating one of the world's most renowned drummers' artifacts? I tracked her down. Her name is Cindy McGurl. And I emailed her. She emailed me back. We followed up with some phone calls. And this conversation that you're about to hear took place during two sessions, the first in February 2024 and the second one in March, just to add on some things that Cindy felt we missed during the first uh, session. Paul Motion was McGurl's uncle. And as he neared the end of his life. He asked Cindy to take possession of his life's work and belongings after he uh, had died. And that's exactly what McGurl has done. After his Paul Motion's death, McGurl got a moving truck, took it into New York City, and drove all of the drummer's possessions back to Rockland, Maine. Uh, I should mention that the apartment she cleaned out was the apartment where I met Paul Motion when I interviewed him back, I think I think it was in 79, the actual interview that we did took place in 79. McGurl um, appears in the 2020 documentary, Motion in Motion, a documentary about Paul and uh, his career. She also hosted Uncle Paul's Jazz Closet. It's a blog and a radio show on a local radio station out in Rockland, Maine. And her dedication to preserving her uncle's legacy is really quite admirable. McGurl has compiled for sale two volumes of Paul Motion's songbooks. I didn't realize what an extensive song catalog Paul Motion has, but indeed he does. And McGurl, who's an artist and bookbinder by trade, has made these songbooks, volumes one and two, into real works of art. Uh, they're beautiful to look at and easy for musicians to use to learn songs, play songs. COVID-19 curtailed Cindy's on-air motion radio shows. So while she's not now producing new Uncle Paul's Jazz Closet podcast. She is digitizing the more than 200 archived shows in her possession, and she is making those available to the public through her website at paulmotion.com. One more point, uh, the autobiography that is referenced several times in this conversation is actually a work in progress. I've had a chance to read it, and it is chock full of interesting observations made by Paul Motion throughout his career. And I should also mention that the Derek Bailey, guitarist Derek Bailey, Paul Motion duo in concert album that Cindy speaks about 
is is available. It is available online, and I am adding the link uh, here. So I would just want to th thank Cindy McGurl for preserving your Uncle Paul's legacy. Thank you for speaking with me. And I know that uh, Paul Motion's life's work has truly been left in, in the right hands. Um, well, you know, he, he was my uncle, and, um, you know, he left me all of his stuff, and so um, I brought it here. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, this, I grew up in Rhode Island, but I moved to Maine, oh, in the um, early 80s, and um, so I've lived here for quite a while, and, um and yeah, I mean, it, it seems like, you know, it what there was kind of when he passed away. It, I mean, it was just a no-brainer to me to just bring his stuff here. Um, when he had told me that um, a few years before he passed away that um, he was leaving me his stuff, but I didn't really like. We never really talked about the details and. <laughs> Um, and I was, when he told me that, I, I don't know, I totally, like, I didn't really understand what he meant, I guess. I thought I did, but I thought he just meant his royalties, you know, his music company, Yaskul Music. And, but he, then he was talking about his papers and all this stuff. And, and he really, you know, he was a real pack rat. I mean, his apartment wasn't very big, but he really... Like he has, I have all of his band books and notebooks and calendars and stuff like that, which he, you know, saved um, from, you know, the, or some stuff goes back to the late fifties. And so I, I said to him, like, this was after he had heart, open heart surgery. And I think that made him think about what's going to happen to my stuff when I die. Mm -hmm. So, cause he, he um, didn't have any children of his own. And I said, well, let's get together and talk about what you want me to do with your stuff after you die. Like, you know, you have to sort of direct me. And he said, uh, you don't have to do anything. He said, you can just do whatever you want and you'll have to pay taxes if you get some money. You'll have to pay taxes on it. And that, and that was like it. And I was thinking we would talk about it again, you know. Yep. <laughs> but we, yeah. And um, so then it, it just, you know, there was a lot of stuff and people helped me clean out his apartment, some different friends and musicians. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really sure. Some people were like, oh, you should just throw stuff out. And then, you know, I was like, no, no, I'm, I, I want to go through things and see what's there. And so um, I just hired a moving company and packed everything up and, brought it here to Maine, and here it is. For a while, I rented an office in Rockland because I didn't really have space at my house. Mm -hmm. My husband is a, a carpenter, um, woodworker, our excellence, and he fixed up part of our house of, that used to be um, a garage, and we insulated it and put a heater in and with a, like a humidity control, and so all his stuff then came here. So Okay. How did you? How did you over the years develop? Uh, obviously, you, you were close w with your uncle, but from what I'm reading, you're not a musician. You're uh, a, a yeah. artist of a different of a different nature. What What was your relationship like growing up with with uh, with your uncle? How did How did that develop? Well, he was you know he was often on the road, so we didn't see him all that much, but he always kept in touch, and he would visit. You know, when I was y younger, you know, he would, when he played more in New York, like in the 60s and early 70s, you know, he would drive up and visit us, spend a few nights, you know, he did that a couple times a year. Um, but he always, he and my mother were really close and they were always chatting on the phone and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, but then he was traveling in Europe a lot, so we saw him a lot less, but, you know. He, the, the, I'd say the last 10 years, like 
I probably spoke to him on the phone at least a couple times a week. And so we had this uh, kind of a fun phone relationship there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't talk about music at all. <laughs> we talked about life, you know, and just, I don't know, sometimes ridiculous stuff. But, um, yeah, so that, you know, that's how it developed. And then at one time, um, I started having these dreams about my grandmother, who was Paul's mother, who was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. And I got interested in family history. And so we talked a lot about that. And because of Paul's travels, he had met different um, cousins and, and other relatives who ended up in Europe. And, and he had done some basic sort of research on the family tree and he gave that to me and then some people happened to come up to him when he was playing in Italy around that time this was like in the late 90s Mm -hmm. 2000s and well maybe actually maybe that was a little bit earlier than that like I actually that was a little earlier probably in the early 90s and they could only they don't they didn't speak English, but they had all these papers with the name Modian on it, and they said that you know our grandparents were cousins, and and so it's this like whole branch of the family that you know we weren't aware of, and so he put me in touch with them, and and so anyway, so I sort of did this whole family tree with his assistance, but he was always like, well, you know, you're uh, it doesn't really matter that stuff. But it's, you know, he's like, you got to live in the here and now. And he always thought of himself as an American, you know, he mm-hmm. definitely was, you know, he didn't want to be known as an Armenian drummer, you know, because he was an American drummer. Yep. But then at the same time, though, he was always asking me questions. Oh, well, what did you find out about this person? Or where, you know, what did you find out about that person? And so I think we shared that interest in, um, in our relatives. So. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I was looking at the the portraits you've done. Uh, you have, you have posted online some some amazing amazing work. Thanks. Yeah, and he he definitely, I feel like he was like he the biggest supporter of my artwork. Like he he was like so encouraging to me, um, and he just really um, that was just a really special part of our relationship. Yeah. Um, you now have. A house, well, first of all, a, uh, your renting space, Uncle Paul's, everything's in there. And how, how, do, you, how do you go from there to, well, first of all, let me, let me step on my own question here. For listeners to this podcast who may not be at all familiar with Paul or a little bit familiar, maybe his work with Bill Evans, maybe maybe some of his, his later work, how would you describe him as a musician? Uh, what, what do you see as his importance to drummers, to jazz fans, jazz composers? Uh, and what do you think is important to keep alive as his legacy? Well, I think, I think that uh, he was very inspirational to other drummers and musicians in that, you know, throughout his life, he, he, he kind of was almost like the Forrest Gump of jazz drumming, you know, <laughs> like he just did so many things. And I think it's because he, he was such an open person. He was always willing to take a gig like in the early days, just because, you know, it, he just needed to work as much as he could. But I think beyond that, he was always willing to sort of take risks about who he played with. He wasn't at all egotistical about it. Like he just like would play with tons of different people, you know, and then if they hit it off, great. And then maybe they play together again. Or if it wasn't that great, then he just wouldn't play with them again. Or I mean, I think it, I didn't know that much about jazz. I mean, I think a lot of people in jazz do that. They play with lots of different groups and lots of different people. But he just, he did that, you know, he did that to a fault, like mm-hmm. all through his life. And um, and I think that, I think one thing about his legacy that 
is his influence on the younger jazz musicians um, because he was always playing with young musicians who were just sort of coming onto the jazz scene. And he really had a knack for uh, playing with people who were really great and, and sort of became more famous than him, you know? And so, yeah, I guess, I guess that. That's good. And he was so prolific. I was, yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd go broke trying to keep up with buying all of the albums under his own name or as the drummer with with somebody else, you know? I mean, there's just a ton, a ton of music that uh, th that he left. Yeah, and he, and I, you know, I mean, that was the thing about when I started sort of trying to organize his stuff a little bit, um, and I kept coming across all these really... Um, cool papers and notes that he wrote and things that he said and, you know, albums that he was on that I'd never heard of before, but then listened to and, you know, thought, wow, isn't this great? And so at one point he went on a purge. He started going on a purge of cleaning out his closets and his apartment, mm. like in, in the, uh, probably was started in the late eighties or something. And, and he would just like put all this stuff in a box and he would just mail it out. I mean, and I think, you know, some of my siblings and cousins also got stuff too, but, um, so every once in a while we get this big box and, and there usually is like a big pile of CDs in there, not just his, but just, you know, other jazz CDs that people sent him or record labels sent him. But then there'd be things from, you know, knickknacks to cashmere, a ca beautiful cashmere, cashmere sweater that he bought in Italy that he never wore again and, and just <laughs> all this stuff so we used to joke that we were going to open a second hand store and we were <laughs> going to call it Paul's Closet and uh. um, and that's where the name that's how I got the name Uncle Paul's Jazz Closet for this show because I started I wanted to I kind of always thought because I had this great collection of jazz CDs I always thought I should have a radio show because we have a couple of local community stations yeah. around, but I never did it. And so then that, after finding all that stuff I wanted to share, that sort of spurred me on to start the show at WRFR, uh, which is in Rockland. And um, so that's why I started doing it. And, and I just, you know, by doing it, I really learned so much about him and about jazz and, yeah, you just, just, uh, my introduction, I was trying to remember this, I'm probably off a little bit, but back again in the 70s was, was Paul's first ECM records under his own name, uh, Tribute and then Conception Vessel. And, yeah. and, and there were, I think the, the thing I liked best about Paul's drumming was that he was, the first drummer I heard who broke away from that very strict ding ding a ding ding a ding ding a ding ding a ding timekeeping, and and I loved what he did without that and how that how that um, impacted the music, and then late later uh, I stumbled on Keith Jarrett's Buy a Blue album, and without looking at the composer I put the put the record on the turntable, and. Beautiful, just a beautiful song. And I look and I said, Paul Motion wrote this song, you know. <clears throat> so the songbook's just stunning. I don't know, you, you did all that work yourself? You put, put those together? Uh, I, yes, I, I self-published it, and, but I really had invaluable help um, from Steve Cardenas, mm -hmm. who's a artist who played with Paul um, and lives in New York City. He... He really he did so much work on it with me um, because, he, like I said, I don't read music even. So he he really went over like I found, I would like find the compositions of the song, scan them, and send them to Steve, and Steve would you know check it out and and be like, oh yeah, this one is really authentic to this recording. So it, it was very meticulously done, and it took. And then I had to I scanned them, and I I did. I did ridiculous things in Photoshop to <laughs> to make it look good. So I, it took a, quite a long time, but it was worth it. They're really, 
I wanted them to be in his handwriting, and and that is what everybody, all the musicians that knew him, that's what they told me they wanted. So in the beginning, when I had the idea of doing that, I, um, you know, I had there were a couple of different publishers that were interested, music book publishers who were mm. interested in publishing it. We would get so far with it, and then they would always go to the wanting to mechanize the compositions. Oh, um, okay. And make them look ugly, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so after like I don't know, I think I went through like three different publishers like that, and then you know, I realized that I mean, just it just isn't really there isn't money in pub- book publishing, right? And um, and I think that that's part of the reason why it was so difficult. So I just decided to self-publish it and, and with the help of Steve and, and also um, Bill Frizzell and was really helpful too with um, helping get it, get it all organized. Yeah, and, well, they look at they, the limited view I get of them online, the covers, a couple of the inside, just really beautifully done. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, they came out good. Well, if you come here, I, I can give you a couple of scratch and dent ones for free if you. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> you can... well, thank you, and I'll uh, let people know through this, through the blog, how how they can get them. You know how how they can order them, and we'll uh, we'll promote them. I didn't realize Paul was that uh, prolific a writer. I mean, I knew he wrote. I knew he wrote well, but when I was looking at the index. In in volume one, volume two, the two volumes of songs. Yeah, two. yeah. I was like, wow, you know. But yeah, there's a, it's a, there's a lot of compositions, and he didn't he didn't publish things until he recorded them. So um, hmm. that there, but on the second and the second volume, I put a, a bunch in there weren't ever recorded also so um you know so i published them myself um and i have a couple of big file drawers full of all his music notes you know like from when he you know when he was composing oh interesting interesting those are really interesting to people who write music i mean Mm -hmm. make sense of them but um but i think that that's like a great part of the archives you mentioned almost in passing on the on the blog and when you're on air talking, um, hosting your show, I'm going to read something from Paul's autobiography, and uh, which caused me to start searching online for Paul's autobiography. You know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I guess it doesn't exist, but is that something that, I mean, I don't know what what you have in the way of total material but do you think you have enough material that you would refer to or Paul referred to as my autobiography that it's something that could be actually made into a a book well that's been you know originally that was the thing that I really wanted to see happen was to see that his autobiography published Mm -hmm. and for maybe for a year or maybe even a little longer, I worked on it with Bill Frizzell's daughter Monica, who um, was very close to Paul, and um, and we did we did sort of put together the first part of the book. But it, it's you know he worked on it for a long time, but it's like sort of almost like more a series of short stories. Yeah, that he, and. If it was given to to a writer to, I don't know, it's it has his voice, like it sounds like him the way he wrote. It it really sounds like him, but it is not at all polished or sort of it, it doesn't read like a biography. Man, well, yeah, I mean, there's nothing that says it has to. I mean, I don't know. It, I, I, there's all kinds yeah. of different autobiographies out there, but even if it was. A notebook, right? Paul's Paul's autobiographical notes or notes by yeah. Paul, something like that would be. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, think I do. I want to do something. I think I'm. I'd probably do something more like just polish it up a little and put it up like as a PDF or something for people to that people could download to read or because it. it I don't know. It. it 
when I started doing the radio show, it just goes so well. The readings go so well with playing oh, yeah. the music in between and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that is something I would like to see happen, but it's been a little problematic just figuring it out. So like I have, you know, he probably, there's probably like a dozen drafts printed out of the book. And I feel like he, he got like, some people were helping him. Some different people were helping him um, edit it. And I, I kind of feel like it sounds better first draft mm-hmm. and some, than what sort of the professional people yeah. helped him do. Like yep. they make, I, I mean, he has kind of a pretty dry writing style anyway, but they, it, it's even drier, you know, like. They scrubbed his personality. I think somewhat, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and then they, but then they're still, so it's kind of a little unorganized. And but I have, it's in the computer, and I've tried to, and the formatting is all screwy, and like it's, I've tried to just redo it, the document, to, and take stuff out. But it just, I just, it's there's no easy way. It really needs to be retyped. I think. Okay. That's the only thing I can think of, and I'm not the person that could do that. <laughs> so. All right. Well, yeah. It's... So anyway, I, yeah, I need I need somebody who would help me with it. I think to to sort of figure it out of what to put up and how to put it together. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, so that's where that is sort of in the sort of unfinished place. I just and I'm not really sure how to do it. You know. Yep. That makes sense. How about um, music? Did you end up with any unpublished recordings of Paul's that might be uh, released at a future date as never-before-released albums, things things like that? Well, I kind of... I'm not really interested in doing that myself, and I don't think Paul would have liked it. Like, okay. I, I think that... I mean, some, there's some stuff, like, recently... Um, Someone put out an album with uh, Bailey Modian. That album is through um, a company called Frozen Reads, which is a small um, publisher based, I think, in Finland. I'm not really sure. Um, And the person, Ian, I don't even know his last name, was working with the Derek Bailey estate, with um, Derek Bailey's widow, um, I'm publishing some cassette, cassettes and different things that were in his collection okay. of, um, you know, in Derek Bailey's archive. And um, they, he had these tapes um, from when he played two concerts with Paul, um, one in the Netherlands and one in New York City. And it's interesting because the two never put out an album together and it's all improvised and, you know, and Derek Bailey is, you know, such a, you know, a giant of jazz guitar. And so they inquired with me if I would give my permission um, because I own the music rights Mm -hmm. for that to come out. And so it's a pretty, I think people don't realize how complicated it is to release unreleased material. So, you know, you have to get permission of all the people that are on the album. So like if you wanted to, you know, sell something that had like a band of five people, you have to get permission and give remuneration to, you know, however many people are playing in the band. Okay. So, you know, that is sort of, that can be a big problem, you know, to get in touch with that many people or their estates. And that's sort of the first step. And then there's also the music rights, if they're playing music that's copyrighted also. So, you know, for this album, it's all improvised. So, you know, the rights are with Derek Bailey and Paul Modian both. Okay. And yeah, so, um, but anyway, but it's it's an unusual thing. And so that is why it was worth pursuing and um and i could see and also with um i have a person hans wendell who helps me with music rights 
and he also listened to what Ian sent to us and um, you know it's a really fantastic concert it did need a lot of digital work to bring it up to high quality but Mm -hmm. uh, we could see by other work that Frozen Reads had put out that they do a really good job with that you know, I think that's an issue for me, and that was an issue with Paul. Like, he couldn't stand it if if somebody recorded something and bootlegged it and it was a horrible quality. Or, or they, you know, they wanted to put something out that wasn't up to snuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I did, I've gotten other inquiries where I didn't give permission because of that. Um, And, you know, because Paul kept such extensive notebooks, like this one concert somebody wanted to put out um, in Paul's notebook, he was really mad (laughs) about the quality of the recording. He thought the engineer did a terrible job. And um, he was also worried that the people were going to be putting it out without his permission. And at the time, and so you know, that was an easy no for me because of that. And because he also, Paul once said to me that, that Bill Evans would hate how all this, all this music of his has been coming out after he died, you know, how there's been a a bunch of different um, recordings that were released after he died because, because he was like, incredibly fussy about what went out and he really poured over it himself before he allowed it to be released. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, I mean, in a way that's, that's an, it's something to take into consideration, but also, but, you know, I I think all that music sounds great, you know? So (laughs) I was going to, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, but it is, it is the perspective of the artist, you know? And Paul so. Paul writes about in in um, his autobiography, he writes about exactly that with Bill Evans, where there was an album that Paul really liked. He thought he thought the band sounded great, and Bill was the opposite. Bill thought it was a subpar performance, and he didn't want the album released. And I think eventually the album was released, and I'm not sure yeah. wh- which which album it was, but. Uh, I agree with you. I, I think I've purchased all of those. Re- is it Resonance Records that's um, coming out with a lot of the new? The um, yeah, they put out like the, um, you know, some. They have that one album of the really old stuff. Some other time. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know it's there's definitely sort of a nostalgia about stuff like that that's really great to hear but yeah I think it has to be balanced um but anyway but so that's how I you know the Derek Bailey album is really great I think and it's very interesting because it's really different um and nothing like that was ever recorded or released while either one of them was alive um you know sometimes it's not really to my mind it's not really worth the trouble to release something that you know maybe those songs were already recorded on a certain album and and the concert is a little different and i play a lot of that stuff on my radio show but i think that's kind of where it belongs um i don't know yeah so that album just came out okay in 2023 the bailey modian album and it is frozen reads it's a pretty small label well you mentioned two two different concerts is that on one album yeah okay it is a, it is on one album, um, so the main release is the concert in the Netherlands, and and the other one isn't as good of a quality, but I, I think they did a pretty good job with it. Um, is the concert in New York? Okay. And so that sort of is sort of an extra. I think that maybe you can get only if you buy the album or something like that. You'd have to. I'd have to look at it again. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but like I said, I mean, it's really nothing to do with me at this point. You know, like it's it was just about giving permission for at the beginning. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. When Paul played in Europe a lot, a lot of those concerts um, were recorded for different European public radio stations oh, and yeah. um and they're really great. I mean some of those I've I have on cassette and I've 
digitized and played some stuff from it. But it isn't likely that you'll see it out as an album because um, the rights are almost always owned by the radio station. Okay. Um, and that's that's just a really hard thing to get permission from them. That would be the starting point to release it as an album. Yeah. And um, so it is, you know, there's many layers of complication. And, and sometimes maybe, you know, like in the original contract, maybe Paul just gave, he gave permission for them to play it on the air live and that's it. You and know what I mean? It. Like yeah. it's, yeah, there can be a whole host of stuff going on. Yeah, when uh, in in uh, the autobiography, there were a few times where Paul was writing about performances uh, live, maybe maybe radio station or television station, and I found myself wondering, huh? I wonder what happened to this music. Was it was it ever recorded? Has it ever been released? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but. But a lot of the stuff he has is, I have all, all of his um, rehearsal tapes, yeah, which are really interesting. I played those on the show quite a bit, and I've been sort of slowly, I'm slowly digit with digitizing them. Great, perfect. That haven't been done, but they're not really the quality of an album release. I mean, they're they're interesting to listen to, but they're not really concerts, you know. Yep, and, I get it. And some of the concerts are really good, but I mostly have cassettes, so that's not really the quality that you want. But also, too, a lot of that music is on albums. You know what I mean? It's already on albums, so... Yeah. Well, yeah. there's and there's computer technology. Did you see, happen to watch the... It was, a, oh, I think it's about a five-minute video trailer for that last song that the Beatles came out with. Together, the single and how they how they did, were able to do that when George was still alive. George was talking with Yoko Ono and uh, asking, "Did did did she have any of John's songs?" And she sent them a cassette of the, the song that the Beatles just released, and it's John. And you can tell he just had a cheapo cassette deck sitting next to his piano, and he's playing the acoustic piano and singing this song. So for years. The technology really didn't allow the separation of John's voice from the piano. And try as they might, the Beatles weren't able to do anything with it. Fast forward a decade or so, and Peter Jackson, filmmaker, had the technology so that he was able to lift John Lennon's voice beautifully right off that tape. And so then the Beatles could, there they had John, and they just added themselves and presto, you end up with a single. So the computer technology to uh, make not such great original recordings sound better has really um, really improved and continues to improve over the years. Yeah, it's true. It, it does. Um, but what's in the future for Uncle Paul's Jazz Cause? It looks like because of dates and things that have you kind of backed off I haven't, um, when COVID happened, I stopped going into the studio in Rockland and making shows at home, which isn't quite as much fun. And I did that for a little while, but then I had a concussion and mm. that was like a little over three years ago. And so I've never gone back. I still have some noise sensitivity issues. You still, I'm sorry, you got you, that guy garbled a little bit. You still have what? Um, noise sensitivity issues, like oh, okay, you know, like loud noise or noise through headphones. Yeah, it's just, it just doesn't sit well with me still. So I don't know if I will go back to making more shows. But then I realized I made you know I I, ha I made over 200 shows. Yeah, like, 223 according to the website. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So there's a lot of shows. So I've been, what I've been doing probably for the past year is I've been going through one, they weren't all up on the web. And so I was going through and I was, I was making the sound a little better sometimes because it, it's an amateur radio station. Sometimes sound wasn't 
very good. So I've been going through and fixing those and then uploading them onto the web. I'm almost done with that. So, so I've been, you know, sort of recycling and reposting older episodes. Okay. Taking pictures of the readings that I did on the show so people can see them. I put those up on Instagram. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know. When I get that, I'm almost done. When I get that all organized, I'll see if I feel like making a new shows or not. So I'm not really sure if I will. For people who will be interested in finding out more about Uncle Paul's Jazz Closet, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, they can go. Uh, there's they can go to the website. There's um, palmodian.com. That's sort of the base website and. There's pages on there that go to Uncle Paul's Jazz Closet blog page, and and those ha- have all the episodes that connect to Podomatic, which is where I upload the shows to. Okay. But you can listen on, um, you know, you can listen on iTunes, and I'm not sure where else it is. Okay. It's up by a few different places, but um, but there's an index on the website now. So you can sort of search if you're interested in a particular person Paul played with or a particular song or a particular group. You can go to that index and you can see what shows relate to that subject. So it's pretty, I think it's, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, so I won't won't say it's easy to navigate, but it's... There is a lot of stuff, and I can tell that you've put a tremendous amount of... uh, TLC into uh, into getting that site the way it is. Uh, obviously, Uncle Paul left his stuff in in uh, good hands. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm easy. If people, I've been really happy with the songbooks, and I sort of did a I don't know a kind of a small run, and but I you know I sold enough of the first volume to pay for the second volume, and so I feel like it's been very successful and I feel like people are playing Paul's music more, you know, because they're available. And, you know, I've had some different music teachers at schools buy them. And, uh, you know, I think that's, I guess that is probably his biggest legacy is his music. Yeah. Um, Less is and, more. Wasn't that his motto? Less is <laughs> And to see, you know, to have people playing it and getting introduced to it when they're younger and stuff, I think that's really great. So one of the things that had me laughing when I was looking through your <clears throat> um, posts was they were looking at the early pictures of Paul uh, in the, in the fifties, he is so much bigger than his drum sets. And that was the days when they were using 18 inch bass drums and, and small bebop sets and things. But then in the last decades of his life, it seemed like, <laughs> His drums got bigger, so it was tough. Sometimes it was tough to see him behind, behind his drums and and uh, cymbals here. But but they always sounded great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was quite the character. When when I was with him and we were talking about music, uh, is or his specifically his songwriting, he told me he'd been working on another tune, and uh, I I can't remember that if I asked. Can I hear it? Or he offered to to play it for me, and and um, I said, you know, sure. So he had a piano in his apartment, and he asked me to turn off my tape recorder, which we, which we did. And he went over and he played just you know da 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 right through the, through the head, and and then he looked at me when he was done, and he said, "I'm going to give that to Keith, and he'll play the shit out of it." <laughs> so uh, yeah, that actually um, that. Kind of reminds me of, yeah, probably one of the nicest things I, him recording himself playing the piano when he's composing. Yeah. And I have a couple of those cassettes that I had digitized and and I played them on the show and those are really super interesting. And Keith Jarrett was just so instrumental in Paul becoming a composer, you know, like he really encouraged him. Yeah. Um, when they when they were in the band together, and that piano belonged to Keith. That was the piano, that grand piano that he had in his apartment was Keith's piano, and Keith sold it to him like for 
you know, cheap and you let them pay a little at a time on it. And so that I think is a pretty interesting legacy. Of- the apartment I rem- where I interviewed Paul is very small. I remember it was very small. I think everything was painted white, all the walls and, uh, and, yeah. and it was a very utilitarian apartment, right? It's like uh, I, almost as if, yeah, I've got these boxes here full of stuff and, and my piano and he had his drum set set up. It was, uh, I think it was the drum set that uh, Joe Lovano ended up with that, he, that, that you see in the documentary, that black yeah. um, drum set. And it didn't look like an apartment that somebody said, I'm home and we're going to stay here for a while, you know, but uh, it was a cool place. It was a great place, great, great vibes. And uh, he was uh, just a really interesting guy to interview. And like many yeah, that's, of... That's where he, he kept that apartment. That's the apartment he was had still had when he passed away. Okay. Um, and so he lived there from like maybe 1966 or 68 or something. Um, all the way to 2011. Uh, yeah, it was the last rent control apartment in the building because the building went condo and the. He had the, the he had the last rent control. <laughs> yeah, and they were. I think they were worried that I was going to try to. Re, re, well, some people have told me they're like, you could claim that you lived here with it. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's uh, well. Every, <laughs> all things happen for a reason, I guess, and. Uh, yeah. Um, all righty. Well, listen. Thank you so much for 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 this conversation.